Lawn of Doom by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 12 Love and Revenge. London, of course, was where Lorna was, but it was five weeks before I saw her. Because I was a kind of prisoner, I was not allowed to move freely around the city, and I had to report every day to the judge's rooms. However, I came before Judge Jeffreys at last. He remembered me, believed my story, and gave me papers which said I was a free man and an honest servant of the king. I was now free to go and see Lorna, but to tell the truth I was a little afraid. It had been a year since she left Exmoor, a year without one word or letter from her. Did she remember the old days in our farmhouse? Did she still love her poor, simple farmer, a man without great riches or a famous family name? It was true that the Rids had held their own land on Exmoor for hundreds of years, but Lorna came from a family that had Scottish kings in its history. Everybody in London knew Lady Lorna Dougal. They spoke of her great beauty and told me how rich she was and that the Queen was very friendly with her. But if Lorna still loved me, then neither riches nor a proud family would keep me away from her. So, with fear and hope in my heart, I went to Earl Brandier's house. It was a very grand place. I was taken upstairs to a little sitting room and told to wait. Then suddenly the door opened and Lorna was standing before me in a simple white dress with her long black hair falling down her back. She was more beautiful than ever. She came towards me, holding out her hand. Gently, I took her hand in mine, then bent and kissed it. Is that all? she whispered. I saw the shine of tears in her eyes, and in another second she was crying in my arms. Darling Lorna, I cried, holding her close to me. I love you dearly, but surely you don't care for me now. Yes, I do, John. Yes, I do. Oh, why have you behaved so unkindly? I am behaving, I replied, as well as I can. No other man in the world could hold you like this without kissing you. Then why don't you do it, John? asked Lorna, looking up at me with a laugh in her bright eyes. After that, of course, there was no more talking for about five minutes. Then my darling pulled away from me and began to question me. John Ridd, you must tell me the truth, the whole truth. Why have you never, for more than a year, taken any notice of your old friend, Lorna Doon? Because, I answered, my old friend and true love sent me not one word or letter in all that time. What? cried Lorna. Oh, no, my poor John! I have often suspected something like this, but she always said... With these words, she rang a bell very violently, and a few seconds later her servant, little Gwenny, came in. Gwenny, said Lorna, what have you done with all the letters I gave you to send to Mr. Ridd? No more lies now. Gwenny gave me a very black look. I didn't send them, she said. You're a grand lady now, mistress. You should marry some grand lord, not a poor farmer from Exmoor. I was only thinking of you. Gwenny, you may go, said Lorna, her voice full of quiet anger. 
I don't want to see you or speak to you for at least three days. At this, Gwenny ran out of the room, crying noisily, and Lorna turned to me. Oh, John, try not to be too angry with her. She loves me very much, and I'm afraid that if you take me, you'll still have to take Gwenny too. I'll take fifty Gwennies, I said, if you want me to. After this, we spoke of ourselves. I tried to tell Lorna that, when she was free to decide her own future, she must think very carefully. The world would say she was mad if she chose to become a farmer's wife. Of course, at Plover's Barrows Farm, she would have a comfortable home, plenty of good food, and all the love and care I could give her. But it was not the same as being a grand lady who owned half of Scotland and who could marry any lord she wanted. Lorna could not wait for me to finish. I decided long ago, dear John, she said very seriously, that you must be my husband. I think it was the day you climbed up the waterfall with your shoes off and a bag of fish for your mother. So, after all these years of loving, shall little things like money and a family name separate us. They mean nothing. I have not been here a year, John, without learning something. Oh, how I hate it. Only my uncle and Gwenny really care for me. All the rest are only interested in my land and money. Oh, John, you must never leave me. It would break my heart. Of course, I gave in at once and said, Darling, you must do exactly what you please. For that, she gave me the sweetest of kisses, and as I left, I went grandly down the great stairs of Earl Brandier's house, thinking of nothing else except that. For the rest of my time in London, I went to see Lorna every day, forgetting all about my poor mother and the work that needed doing on the farm. Then one day I received a letter from Lizzie, and I realised that I must get home as quickly as possible. My darling Lorna cried and held me close, but she understood why I had to go. Lizzie's news was this. Jeremy Stickles and his soldiers had finally made their attack on Dune Valley, but it had failed, and Jeremy had been injured. This was the worst possible thing for Exmoor. Now the Dunes would make more trouble than ever before, and of course they would attack our farm. When I got home, I learnt that the Dunes were robbing everyone around them, and the whole of Exmoor was living in fear of them. Then, a few weeks later, something even more terrible happened. The Dunes came one evening to the farmhouse of Kit Badcock, a neighbour of ours, while he was out working in his fields. They broke down the door and stole his young wife, Marjorie. Two of them carried her, screaming and fighting to their horses, and then rode away. Meanwhile, the other Dunes were searching the house for food and drink to steal, and one of them found the Badcock's little son crying in the kitchen. He picked the baby up, threw him into the air, and let him fall onto the hard stone floor. The child's neck was broken and he died at once. It made me sick just to think of the cruelty of this man, and when people heard this terrible story, they were very angry. They said it was time for the people of Exmoor to take their own revenge. Men from all the farms and villages of Exmoor 
came to see me. We cannot expect any more help from the king against the dunes, they told me. Because Jeremy Stickle's attack failed, the king has refused to send any more soldiers. But we've had enough of the dunes. We want to attack them ourselves, and we want you to lead us, John. I said I was no leader, but they would not listen to this. Try to lead us, they said, and we will try to follow. In the end, I agreed to do as they asked. I thought we had a chance against the dunes, if enough of us decided to fight. There were fewer of them now. Some had been killed in the rebel fighting, and some during Jeremy's attack. We arranged to meet again and make a plan. Tom Faggus, now quite well, rode over to join us, and he soon had a very clever idea. We're not soldiers, he said, and we'll never defeat the Dooms if we try to fight all of them in their valley. So we must lay a trap. You know the caves on Exmoor where gold was once found? Well, we'll tell a story around Exmoor that men have been digging secretly and have found a new cave with rocks full of gold. We'll say that the gold will be taken away on a certain night at a certain time. The Dunes will naturally plan to attack and steal this gold, but some of us will make a trap for them in the caves. Meanwhile, the rest of us will attack the valley as soon as we know that some of the robbers have left. The second part of our plan was this. Tom would take some of our men and pretend to attack the Dune Gate, while our main attack would really come from the waterfall end of the valley, the route I had discovered so long ago. The plan went well. The story about the gold was whispered in the right ears, and on the agreed night our spies watched a large group of robbers leave Dune Valley on their way to the caves. Meanwhile, as the moon rose above the hills, I was leading my twenty men to the bottom of the waterfall. John Fry, our old farm worker, was in the mountains which looked down into the valley. When he saw the fighting start at the Dune Gate, he would fire his gun as a signal to us. Soon the sound of John's gun rang around the mountains, and I and my men climbed up the waterfall and into the valley. Tom's men were making as much noise as possible at the Dune Gate, and all the Dunes had run to join the fight there. We went quietly along the valley, keeping to the shadows under the trees, until we came to the dune town. Then we got to work with our fire sticks, and before long every dune house was on fire. We took good care, however, to burn no women or children, and we made sure that they were all out of the houses first. When they saw the flames and smoke rising from their houses, the Dune men came running back from the gate. By the time they reached us, the whole valley was burning, houses, trees, everything, right up to the sides of the mountains. As the men came towards us, we saw that there were only twelve of them. In the bright firelight, they could not see us, but we had them right in front of our guns. There were so few of them that I thought we could take them as prisoners. But my men did not wait for a word from me. They saw the chance of revenge on the men who had burnt their homes and stolen their women for so many years. They fired, 
and five dunes fell dead. The robbers fired back wildly, but they could not see us clearly in the shadows. Soon all the guns were empty, and the battle became hand-to-hand -hand fighting with knives and sticks. I stood to one side. The only doon I wanted to meet was Carver. But as I started to look for him, I saw something white in the grass, moving close to the ground. I ran to see what it was and found the counsellor. I recognised him from Lorna's descriptions, and here he was, on his hands and knees, trying to escape from the fighting. The white thing I had seen was his long, white hair. When he saw me, he got to his feet. He knew at once who I was. John Ridd, he said, won't you be kind to an old man? Let me get away from this violence, John. I will let you go free, sir, I said, but on one condition. Tell me honestly which Doon killed my father. I will tell you honestly, he said, though it hurts me to say it. It was my son, Carver. I thought it was him, I said, but you were not there, so I don't blame you. I've always been against violence, the counsellor said, shaking his head sadly. And now, John, let me go. He was an evil, lying old man, but I let him go. I don't know what happened to him, but he was never seen again on Exmoor. Then I went to look for Carver but did not find him. Afterwards, I heard that he had led the dunes who had gone to the gold caves. Our trap was successful, and all the dunes had been killed. All except Carver, who had ridden his horse through the attackers and escaped. The dunes were totally defeated, though. When the sun came up above their valley the next day, all their houses were nothing but blackened wood. We had lost sixteen men in the fighting, but out of nearly forty dune men, only Carver and the Counselor were left alive. But the thought that Carver, that cruel and violent man, was still living somewhere on the moors, did not give me much peace. Chapter 13 The Last Battle The next thing that happened was the return of Lorna, my Lorna, my own darling. She stepped out of her coach and ran into the house, as happy as a bird to get home again. All the house was full of brightness and sunshine, as she ran here and there, laughing and talking. Oh, how she loved this old chair, and she must see the kitchen fire, and where was her old friend the cat? As for me, I threw my best hat over the hayricks and shouted for happiness. Lorna was now free to make her own decisions, she told us. Earl Brandeer had died. She had grown to love this fine old gentleman, and was very sad at his death, but now she could do what she wanted, even marry that good servant of the king, John Ridd. At last the waiting and the worrying was over, and happiness was ours. But in her softest moments, when she was alone with me, Lorna could not quite hide the fear that still lay deep in her heart. I felt it too, a fear that something evil, something terrible could still happen. There was great excitement all over Exmoor when people heard of our wedding. 
Everyone had heard of the defeat of the Dunes and the strength of John Ridd and the beauty of Lorna. People came from more than thirty miles around. Mother, Annie and Lizzie arranged everything with the help of Uncle Ben's granddaughter, Ruth, who had also come for the wedding. When the day came and Lorna stepped up to my side in Orr Church and took my hand, I was afraid to look at her. She was so beautiful, so fresh and lovely in her simple white dress. But when we had each said, I will, and my ring was on her finger, we turned to each other. Her laughing eyes were serious now, and full of so much love that my heart nearly stopped beating. Darling eyes, the loveliest, the most loving eyes. Then the sound of a shot rang through the church, and those eyes were clouded with death. Lorna fell at my feet, and her bright red blood ran over the wooden floor. I lifted her up, whispering soft words of love, but as she leant her head on my chest, her eyes closed, and she breathed her last goodbye to life. Then I laid my wife in my mother's arms and went out for my revenge. Of course, I knew who had done it. There was only one man in the world who could do a thing like this. I jumped on my horse and rode away fast. I don't remember who showed me the way. I only know that I took it, and the men fell back before me. Soon the shouts of some men told me that I was getting close, and there, ahead of me, rode a man on a great black horse, and I knew that the man was Carver Doon. His life or mine, I said to myself. Whatever God decides, but the two of us cannot live in this world one more hour together. I had no weapons, and I knew he had a gun, but I also knew, as surely as night follows day, that I would kill this man. He rode up onto the moors, and I followed. His horse was fast, but he did not know this part of Exmoor. He rode straight into a little valley from which I knew there was no escape because at the end of it there was only a black, bottomless bog. As I rode after him, I reached up to a tree that was growing in the rocks above me and broke off a great branch. Then Carver turned a corner and saw what he was riding towards. He pulled back from the bog in fear, and, turning his horse, he fired and rode straight at me. The bullet hit me somewhere, but I took no notice. I put my horse across his path, lifted the branch above my head, and brought it down hard on his horse's head. Both horse and man crashed to the ground. Before Carver could move, I jumped down. He got up with a black look on his face and started to speak. For an answer, I hit him on the side of the face. I would not dirty my mouth by speaking to this man now. Then he ran at me and put his hands around my neck. I had never met strength like this and felt my neck would break, but I took hold of his arm and almost pulled it from his shoulder. Then I took him by the neck, as he had done to me. His eyes burned with anger, and he threw himself against me. But God gave me great strength that day. In two minutes he was lying on the ground, half dead. I will not hurt you any more, I said, when I could breathe again. Carver Doon, you are beaten.
Go on your way. Thank God you are alive and never come near me again. But it was too late. The black bog had him by the feet. As he lay like a mad dog in front of me, the ground itself began to pull him in. In our murderous battle, we had not noticed where we were going. I only just managed to jump with my last strength from the terrible blackness, but I could do nothing for Carver. While his mad eyes stared and his arms waved wildly above his head, the black bog pulled him down, and he disappeared from sight. I don't know how I got home. I had lost a lot of blood. By the time I got to the farm, I was riding in a dream. John Fry took my horse away, and Mother led me indoors. I have killed him, I said, as he killed Lorna. Now let me see my wife. She belongs to me, though she is dead. You cannot see her now, John, said Ruth, coming forward. Annie is with her now. What does that matter? Let me see my dead one and then die. All the women moved away from me, crying. Only Ruth stood by me and put her little hand in mine. John, she is not your dead one. She may still be your living one and your wife, but you must not see her now. The sight of you like this will certainly kill her. I could not understand what she was saying, but I let them lead me upstairs to my bed. The bullet had broken a bone in my chest, and I was soon in a fever. It was only much later that I learnt how Ruth had saved Lorna's life. When I had run out of the church, Ruth had taken control. She made John Fry and the other men carry Lorna home immediately. There she cut off the wedding dress, pulled the bullet from Lorna's wound, and stopped the bleeding with cold water. All this time, Lorna lay still and white, and everyone was sure that she would die. But Ruth covered the wound with a cloth, kept her warm, and made her drink a little wine from a spoon. And after a while, everyone could see that Lorna was still breathing. She lay close to death for many days, but with Ruth's loving care, she slowly began to get better. Meanwhile, I lay in my bed, only half conscious, and in my fever I did not believe them when they told me Lorna was still alive. I knew in my heart that she was dead, and I had no interest in life. A life without Lorna was worthless, without meaning. Mother cried and thought that I would die. But after six weeks, the fever left me. I was so weak that I could not leave my room. Outside, the sun shone on the spring flowers. But in my misery, I cared nothing for the beauty of the world. Then, the next morning, Ruth came to see me. John, she said, are you well enough to see your wife? I was afraid to bring her before, while you were so ill. I don't understand, I said, staring at her. She went away, then came back, and behind her was Lorna. Ruth closed the door and ran away and Lorna stood before me. But she did not stand for long. 
She ran to me and managed to get into my arms, although they were too weak to hold her. She put her warm, young face against mine and would not look at me, preferring kissing to looking. I felt my life come back to me. I felt the happiness of living and of loving. I felt the sweetness and the sadness of my Lorna's tears and the softness of her loving lips. And the world, suddenly, was a good place again. I have not much more to tell. Over the days that followed, Lorna sat beside me and we watched each other getting better. We have never tired of watching each other since. Now we live peacefully on the farm. Though Lorna still has great riches, we never use the money except for some poor neighbour. I sometimes buy her beautiful clothes, but she soon gives them away or keeps them for the children. Tom and Annie are happy, except for a few small adventures. Tom remains on the right side of the law, and they have honest children. Lizzie married the captain of Jeremy Stickles' soldiers, who had stayed with us when we fought the dunes. Ruth is not married yet, but there is a man who loves her as much as I love Lorna, and I'm sure he will win her soon. But of Lorna herself, my darling wife, I won't say much. A man should not talk too much about the best thing in his life. Year by year, her beauty and her loving kindness grow greater, and after all this time and all that has happened to us, she is still my Lorna Dune.